All right. Well, everyone, uh, welcome. Thank you for coming. Today is the July 21st, and this is the CRC Roundtable for Changing the Face of Bay Restoration and Science. And we're very welcomed and, and very happy to have you all here today. We have a wonderful, wonderful uh, agenda and some very interesting speakers here to share some very interesting topics with you. Of uh, just a couple webinar ground rules. Uh, you know, please stay muted with your camera off while speakers are presenting. Um, just want to make sure that uh, during the second half of the webinar, we're able to uh, get into some discussions and you all can put your, feel free to put questions in the chat um, or in the other feature as well as uh, raise your hand to speak. Um, if uh, at the end, we'll have a little Q&A as well. Um, so again, just welcome. So why are we here? Um, we are faced with a, a challenge within our Chesapeake Bay watershed that we have, in the words of our executive director, Denise, um, what has gotten us here will not get us where we need to go. Um, so there's a bit of a effort or e emphasis that <clears throat> needs to be made around changing the face of restoration for the Chesapeake Bay and science and how we recruit and do outreach for finding more uh, diverse and inclusive talent. Um, and that and that shape takes shape through different types of programs like the C String program, uh, which stands for the Chesapeake Student Recruitment, Early Advisement, and Mentoring program. And I am the newest uh, program coordinator for the Chesapeake Research Consortium uh, C String program. And the C String program, uh, in a nutshell, really is just geared around finding diverse talent, finding unique talent, um, and providing an opportunity for them to uh, showcase their expertise um, in the environmental field, um, and that may be from underrepresented uh, in environmental research. The primary goal of C-Stream is to encourage and support uh, students interested in leadership positions, in environmental protection, and restoration careers, uh, nature-based careers as well. The program works closely with academic institutions and government agencies within the Chesapeake Bay Partnership uh, to place selected students into meaningful summer internships and to support those students in their academic work and facilitate pathways for successful careers in environmental research, restoration, and or management. Um, working with HBCUs, has been also a very integral part of the program. Um, and the vision for the future of the program is to uh, build its capacity by using two theoretical frameworks uh, that stem right out of public health and that are asset-based theory and the community uh, organizing theory. Um, and those basically are just means to identify where some of the resources are in some of these underrepresented communities and finding out how they've been able to uh, function thus far and seeing how we can pivot or piggyback or add to uh, that, that resource wealth. Um, we encourage all of our interns to obtain doctorate degrees. And so encouraging graduate school is also a big part of this program's future, as well as partnering with different media outlets to promote stories uh, about some of these interns and how they got into their careers um, so that others in the administrative and executive fields uh, in this industry can have a more meaningful uh, an engagement and learn as much as possible uh, from each other. So with that being said, um, we want to introduce uh, who we have here today. On our panel, we have uh, some wonderful guests here. Um, Mr. John Wolf, who is a C-Stream mentor and a Chesapeake Bay program uh, partner as well. He also works at the US Geological Survey. And Mr. John is part of the G GIS team leader for the Chesapeake Bay program in Annapolis, Maryland. Uh, he is a responsible for planning and coordinating and applying GIS 
to address bay conservation and restoration issues. Um, also here with us today, we have Nicholas Coleman. And Nicholas Coleman uh, actually was a part of the inaugural Sea Stream internship uh, cohort. He also is uh, part of the University of Maryland's Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. He's from Upper Marlboro. Uh, and he's a graduate from Coastal Carolina University with a BS in marine science and a minor in biology. And during his undergraduate experience, he participated in the uh, Sea Strain program, the CRC, and during 2018 and 2019. Um, and now he's currently a graduate student at University of Maryland Center for Environmental Science. And he's working with the Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. And I'll let him tell you a little bit more about himself when that time comes. Uh, and also, last but not least, we have Bailey Bosley who is a current right now Sea Stream intern. Um, and she's working with uh, the GIS uh, team uh, with the Chesapeake Bay program. And she's also attending Towson University. Um, Bailey is a very interesting person uh, and very talented. And you'll definitely get to see what she brings to her office and her internship and, and the future in the world together. Um, so, that being said, uh, now that we had those introductions done, um, the topic today, uh, we're gonna kick it off. And the topic today basically is just, you know, our ability to take a look forward and look behind and look to the future. Um, so to do that, we're gonna kick it off with Mr. John Wolf. Thanks, Kenyatta. So yeah, I am, um, as he mentioned, I am the GIS team leader at the Chesapeake Bay Program Office in Annapolis, and I work for USGS. Uh, this is my first year as a mentor with the Sea Stream Program, but there are some colleagues of mine on the GIS team who have served as mentors actually for the past three years, I guess, since the inception of the program. So I'm, I'm going to share some of my experiences, but also draw on some of their experiences as well. So I'm going to actually share my screen. I have a, a very basic PowerPoint here. So hopefully, hopefully you can see that. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background on, on my, let me switch this here. My background, so when I was in high school, many, many years ago, I was interested in environmental science as a, a number of our current interns are, I'm sure, and, and that's part of the reason they're in the program. But I wasn't exactly sure what my path would be. So I, I decided to, when I went to college, to sort of start very general. And so I decided I would just start with pursuing a, a bachelor's degree in biology. And so that, that served me well because it gave me uh, exposure to a lot of different potential career paths. Um, but then over the years, as, as is probably often the case, um, my focus became more and more specific, more and more tied to particular topics and, and disciplines. And so over time, I went back and, and pursued other academic um, training for, for both computer science as well as geographic information systems ultimately. So my, my professional experience, I'm gonna talk a little bit about my inspiration here in a minute, but my professional experience has been largely split between state government in a number of different capacities with the state of Maryland and now the federal government with the Chesapeake Bay program, both with the National Park Service and with USGS. So my actual inspiration, we were asked to, to talk a little bit about this in terms of how we got where we are today, um, actually has its origins with a, a conference that I attended back in the dark ages of, of 1988, which was prior to many of our in all of our interns existence, I'm sure. <laughs> so it was the very first Towson GIS conference um, and the, the Towson GIS conference is still going on. And in fact, Bailey and I are presenting in a couple of weeks at this year's Towson GIS conference. But when I went to this conference in 1988, I really didn't have any, uh, any background in, in terms of GIS. There wasn't really much in terms of GIS in 1988. And I don't remember much about any specific sessions, but I do remember sitting in on a, a luncheon keynote um, presentation by Ian McHarg. And so 
Many of you know who that is. He's the author of Design with Nature. He is the, uh, in some ways, the father of environmental planning and interdisciplinary environmental planning. He was re largely responsible for the plan for the valleys in Baltimore County, which was a landmark uh, plan for, for a county in terms of protecting resources while still allowing for development. And so Ian McCard spoke for about an hour at lunch that day. He uh, was basically one long uh, run on sentence, if you will. <laughs> he, has a, he had a deep Scottish accent and uh, he basically stood up there and chain smoked and talked about environmental planning and he intermixed it with a lot of profanity and I was actually uh, quite taken by this, not so much that style, but the, 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 the content and the subject. He was basically explaining this uh, design with nature approach that he had advocated and really invented. And so I came away from that and still 30 some years later, I, 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 um, it sticks in my head as being sort of a career inspiration, if you will. So. The moral of the story is for the interns is you never know where these inspirations might come from. They might come from your mentor or they might come from a conference or some other place entirely. So that's kind of my background and how I got into GIS, which was a natural extension of that Ian McCarg um, phase. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the experiences of the GIS team and a little bit broader in terms of USGS, in terms of the C-Stream program in particular. So these are some sort of take home messages or lessons learned. And so these internships are pretty much take uh, most of the summer, I guess they're 12 week period. And so this is again, the third year that we've done this. And so one thing that right off the bat that we feel is really important is it's really important to do some advanced planning before your intern arrives. And so that some of that occurs when you're actually conceiving of a project. Um, but it really extends all the way up until the day that they arrive to make sure that logistics are under control and the subject matter and contacts and all that kind of thing is already in place. Another thing with respect to mentorship, and this is something that was not planned, but the idea that we have effectively rotated uh, mentors within the GIS team from year to year. And so that has a couple of benefits. One is just a broader exposure of interns to different ideas and, and types of projects, but it's also useful from the mentor's perspective in that we uh, have the ability to sort of divvy up the, the workload. Not that, that working with interns isn't a complete joy, but it is time con consuming. And so being able to split that up among different professionals uh, is a good thing. So Obviously, we've been dealing with some in-person internships, uh, I mean, as well as virtual internships the last two years. The program started with intern in-person internships. Um, there are benefits to both, or, and there are challenges with both. Um, in terms of the virtual internships this year and last year, one, one thing that uh, it actually opens up is that you have the ability to have an intern that is not uh, dependent upon being within commuting distance, for example. And so when I had the opportunity to advertise, if you will, with one of these, I, I, I reached out really nationally for, for potential interns. And wouldn't you know it, I end up with an intern from Towson. So, so, so that has good, um, there's good aspects to that as well as not so good. Another thing that we've found is that it's great if your intern, uh, the project that they're working on is in alignment with some existing or emerging priorities. And so, so what does that mean in the, in the Chesapeake um, context? So we have any number of, of priorities, both with respect to the, the Chesapeake Bay pollution diet, but any number of other topics. And so for the internship to be relevant and timely to those topics is, is kind of a, that's definitely a plus because you're going to get more engagement and support from a, a broader array of folks. Another thing we've done in the last couple of years is co-mentor with other entities in the Bay program. And a couple, couple that come to mind are the diversity work group, but also the climate resiliency work group. So if you can bring mentors to a, and kind of a team-based approach to combine expertise, that can actually be very effective so that the intern is exposed to a broader array of, of topics. And then for those of you familiar with Chesapeake Research Consortium, um, the fact that they have a staffers program 
um, which are early career folks and the idea to, to the potential to better engage with those staffers by the interns uh, makes a lot of sense to us. And I know I don't have a lot of time left, but I'm just gonna real briefly, there's also benefits to us, the inst hosting institution in terms of us being exposed with respect to underrepresented populations uh, to be exposed to some of those issues. There are benefits to the interns in terms of getting some other soft skills, presenting, uh, writing and so forth. Having the ability to interact with professionals to show that most scientists are human and approachable, maybe not all of them, but most of them are. And then uh, just a couple other things, they op the idea that you use this opportunity to build the student's confidence when they can you know, present their work. And for us, it's an opportunity to also sort of recharge our batteries with a fresh look and a youthful look at some of these topics. So those are just some of the thoughts I wanted to uh, share with us today and we can follow up as necessary or as appropriate after the other presentations. <clears throat> wow. Uh... So let me just make sure I'm hearing you correctly, Mr. Wolf. You basically are sharing with us uh, essentially enough information you could write a book about just that alone. <laughs> um, it's very interesting. And I like what you said about, you know, not always knowing where your motivation or inspiration may come from. Um, so often us as in this field, we often kind of get kind of siloed and, and what's traditional in regards to where we go and what we are attracted to. But if I'm hearing you correctly, you're saying that, you know, that that inspiration was very unusual or unorthodox, but <clears throat> in a way that actually helped to shape your future. Yes, and that inspiration can come from any number of places. That's kind of what I wanted to emphasize. Yeah. Thanks very much. That's a good point. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And so next up, uh, we have Mr. Nicholas Coleman, and I believe uh, he is ready to go. So I'm going to turn it right on over to him. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so thank I had a uh, similar experience as John in the sense that I've always been interested in marine science, as I'm sure everybody in uh, our environmental science, and I'm sure everybody within this discussion has been. But uh, in my you know freshman sophomore year. I uh, was trying to pinpoint what um, aspect of marine science I was most interested in. And I was drawn to fisheries, but uh, I quickly realized that fisheries is almost just as broad as marine science, and there's uh, a lot of routes you go down. And um, I had the opportunity to be a part of the inaugural cohort uh, for the uh, Sea Stream program, which really helped me uh, explore what aspects of fisheries and also within environmental and marine science that I was uh, interested in the most. And it's actually facilitated um, my progression into grad school. So in 2018, I did a internship at the Smithsonian Environmental Research Center uh, with Matthew Ogburn uh, on a project that used acoustic telemetry to track the migration of um, six fish and invertebrate species in the Road River, which is a, Chesapeake, which is a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, one of the cool things during that project is one of the uh, species that I was tracking with acoustic telemetry was an Atlantic sturgeon. And I, growing up in my life, or growing up in the uh, Chesapeake Bay, uh, my whole life, and wasn't really aware of the presence of Atlantic sturgeon in uh, the Chesapeake Bay. But, uh, and also acoustic telemetry was something I was really drawn to. It was, it was really interesting. And I got my first exposure to the methodologies associated in its application of fishery science um, during that internship. And uh, I collect, I got data from a lot of scientists within the Chesapeake area, Chesapeake Bay. And one of those uh, scientists was Dr. David Secor, who is actually uh, my current advisor. So my, uh, for at University of Maryland, uh, Chesapeake Biological Laboratory. So my um, internship during, at CERC, uh, really directly led to my uh, graduate position because I exchanged information with Dr. Secor and uh, we kind of stayed in contact while I was an undergrad. And, uh, and as I was finishing up, he let me know he had a position open. And now my current master's project um, uses acoustic telemetry and sonic imagery to estimate the population abundance of Atlantic sturgeon in the uh, Nanticoke River, which is also a tributary of the Chesapeake Bay on the Eastern shore. 
So it was kind of cool to see that come full circle. And, um, you know, John talked a lot about putting your putting you into contact or C-Stream interns in contact with professionals. And I think that's a great example of how that relationship facilitated uh, the growth and um, maturation of my uh, science career. Um, but also in 2019, I had the opportunity to work with um, uh, Dr. Mary Fabrizio at the at the Virginia Institute of Marine Science, and that was also a great experience. So I was uh, fortunate to participate uh, two years in the um, Sea Stream program, and it was a great experience. And it was a little bit different than acoustic telemetry. I worked on a project that used uh, macroinvertebrate assemblages to assess uh, habitat quality for black sea bass, but um, it was just a, a good way to continue my progression and identify things that. I would be interested to continue to pursue and it provided me with a lot of <clears throat> professional skills. Like I got my first uh, taste of uh, R, which is a highly, uh, you know, sought out programming skill for a lot of um, graduate students and students looking to continue their progression in marine science. So it was a wonderful experience. Um, but uh, through this process, you know, I've continued to grow as a marine, uh, as marine scientist and Currently, I'm in California uh, doing an internship uh, with the NOAA Santa Cruz Lab, uh, where I'm using acoustic telemetry and uh, sonic imagery to estimate the population size of green sturgeon in the Sacramento River. So it's, I've had, you know, through the internship, like, internship experience that I've gleaned through the Sea Stream, I think they both greatly prepared me to take the next steps in doing an internship as a graduate student and um, try to progress and be ready to enter the workforce for you know a federal position like NOAA. Wow. So, and we talked about inspiration before, but I mean, you, you're not, you know, you're a very, uh, very accomplished young man for your age. And, you know, you've done a lot, you've seen a lot, I mean, where does your biggest influence or inspiration come from? That's a, that's a good question. Um, <laughs> my biggest influence or inspiration. I really think that I uh, all of my mentors that I've had have really played a key role in facilitating my um, inspiration. I mean, I keep in contact with uh, all of them frequently. So after I finish uh, my internships, I continue to bug them and you know reach out to them every couple <laughs> months just to check in and make sure um, yeah see how they're doing. But I think you know those individuals have played a huge role in my ability as a scientist and. <clears throat> really helped me to the point where I am now. That's great, man. That's an amazing story. And uh, I'm, I'm always fired up when I hear you talk about, you know, your, your experiences and your future because uh, you are, you know, you're, you, you are, the, you know, the prototype uh, for Black excellence, you know, and that's something that we, you know, we have to be very unapologetic about um, because <clears throat> we're trying to promote more inclusivity um, in this industry. And like I said before, what has kind of gotten us where we are is not going to get us to where we want to go, um, especially as it relates to sustainability. It's going to take a complete new um, and kind of fresh um, workforce to carry out some of these scientific endeavors. And uh, you're right at the you're right at you're right at the home of that. Um, so just want to tip my hat to you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, so next up we have Bailey Bosley. And Bailey is a current intern right now with the C-Stream program. And let me just tell you, she is doing some amazing work. Uh, she's developing gamification applications. Uh, she's using com communicating uh, place-based landscape changing scenarios. Uh, she's dealing with GIS uh, team at the Chesapeake Bay program. And I'll just let her, you know, kick it off to her. Thank you so How much, you doing, Bailey? Bailey. I'm doing no good, problem. thank you. Um, real quick, I, um, when I thought about doing this webinar, I, 
a lot of different things sort of ran through my head. I have a bunch of things I would like to talk about. So if I start to take too long, just, you know, interrupt me, let me know and I'll, I'll wrap it up here. But um, yeah, thank you. All right. So hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bailey Bosley. Like Randy said, um, I'm a senior at Towson University. Um, I'm studying environmental science um, and GIS. So first, I just kind of wanted to take a step back and talk a little bit about my um, academic journey because I'm in a much different place than I was a few years ago. Um, I first started with a computer science, or I was working towards a computer science degree at, um, at a community college. But uh, when, I, when I neared the end of that program, I started to realize like, you know, this is great, but something just didn't quite feel right. And I wanted to uh, reconnect with my original interests when I was in high school. Um, I've always loved nature. My family, we have a, a small garden where we grow our own vegetables. And I think um, unconsciously this kind of fueled my interest uh, into this field. But, you know, I grew older and I learned about these environmental challenges we're facing. And I just, I wanted to be part of the solution um, in some way. So that's, that's kind of why my studies shifted back to what they are today. Um, in terms of my studies, I tend to focus on plants because um, I often feel like they're, you know, underrepresented in, in research. Um, but I also, I wanted to mention that uh, my GIS studies, it, it was never initially part of my plan. Um, I needed to take an elective, and so it just kind of fell right into my lap, and I took that class and was like, this seems like really cool. I need to know more about this, um, so I added that, and that added more time to me being a student, and so it already took me um, five years about to get an associate degree, and I just, I just want to say I think a lot of students feel compelled that they had to complete their studies and graduate with a bachelor's in, in four years, but you know that's not a, it's not the case. You know it's certainly not the case for me. Um, it's just something I like to stress. You know that the finishing your education is not a race, and everybody goes through uh, life differently. You know you don't know what you want to do for the rest of your life when you're 18. Um, so yeah, after that, I was I was really worried that I wasted my time. You know, and I was discouraged because I I hadn't just started off with um, environmental science which, you know, I've always cared about the environment. Why didn't I just start with that? But um, it, it seemed really daunting to me. I, I think that's one of the main reasons I didn't just go for it at the beginning. You know, I want to help solve these problems, but they seem like such huge, challenging tasks. So I was hesitant to do that. Um, and I would say to any student listening, or if I could go back in time and tell myself, you know, you're not expected uh, to solve all the world's problems overnight or by yourself. Um, and I think that's something that um, has been fueled by the, the school system and maybe why there's not as much diversity uh, in this workforce. Um, there's like a lot of places that have um, a lack of information or information availability for these types of fields that, that Nick and I work in. Um, but at Towson, I will say that the faculty is like really there for you. That's how I found out about this internship. The head of the department likes to tell um, all the students, you know, like, hey, there's this this coming up and this coming up. And and I, I would get these emails, but I never felt truly qualified uh, for any of them. And so I missed out on a lot of opportunities um, for not being confident in my abilities. But then one day I got this email um, about this internship with John and immediately I was like, I need to jump on this because it, it reignites my interest in video games, which was my original uh, goal was to make video games. So, but now I get to combine a GIS data with gaming engines. So it just seemed like the, for, the perfect step uh, for me to um, you know, go in my next uh, steps in life. So the C-Stream program has been a really great opportunity for me, um, and I'm super grateful to have been able to participate in it. I know we still have a month left, but um, it's allowed me to talk to a bunch of people that I never thought that I would be able to meet. And you know, getting to know them as well as my fellow interns has been really eye-opening for me to see all these different perspectives and all the different work that people do. Um, but the, it's also helped me to learn more about uh, you know, real-world opportunities, or like um, career work, like how to apply for jobs and networking. And I know um, the program has only recently been implemented virtually, much like everything else um, due to the pandemic, but I hope in the future that they can continue to have um, some virtual, at least some virtual um, opportunities because, you know, for me being virtual really made this opportunity possible for me. I know that I am in Towson, it's not super far away from, from where John works in Annapolis, but you know, it still made this possible for me. Um, 
and being virtual, um, like John said, it does come with its own set of challenges because we are working remotely. I think um, everybody you know, needs to be good at working independently and being motivated. Um, time management is crucial, but communication, I think, um, is really critical, not only for um, you know, in person, but also virtually because you know, when, you're, when you have in person, you can just you know, walk into your, your mentor's office and ask them a question. But John and I have done really well, I think, um, with keeping in, tr um, keeping in touch for this. Um, but like John said, I think um, virtual internships can have um, you know, more opportunities for a wider range of students, you know, as we see that a lot of work can be done um, remotely. Uh, but most importantly, I think this internship has allowed me to see um, more of the real world you know, in class. Um, they present us with these problems, and I often think they tend to just be linear and, you know, like, here's a problem, here's your solution, you know, that's kind of how it is, but uh, John has been showing me that that is not the case, you know, just the application that I'm working on, it's not A to B, it's like A to A.1, <laughs> you know, it's not a straight line, um, and I got to meet members of his team, um, and they've provided me with a lot of uh, advice and insight. Um, and I just really value the connections that I've made there. Um, so let me just briefly talk a little bit about the project that I've been working on. Um, it, it combines GIS data into game engines um, where once it's in the, the game engine, it can be manipulated in whatever way really possible by the engine. So I've been experimenting with that and it's still in beta. So um, it's got some bugs, you know, things don't work properly. Um, you know, it's still a work in progress, but it's still it's still been interesting to work with. Um, I've been using Unity, that's the name of the game engine. And like I said, you can basically do whatever you want. It's just figuring out how to implement it in the engine. Um, so real quick, let me see if I can share my screen and try to wrap up here, because I know I've been talking a while. Yeah, um, you're all right. So you got about one minute left. OK, cool. So I'll just show this real quick, and then I will just talk about the future here. So this is just kind of what you can already see. This is Harper's Ferry. Um, this is just in the scene viewer that is already provided as like a web service by Esri. And then this is what I've been able to add in um, this water um, in the game engine scene, which actually moves. I didn't want to, I didn't know if the Unity would play quite properly for the webinar. So I just did that. Um, yeah, so that's what I've been working on. And then in terms of the future, you know, I do feel that this internship has provided me with a lot of just a lot of things I never thought about and people I never thought I would meet. So I don't know where I might go in life. I have so many interests, um, even this, with this internship, you know, I, I don't know. I, I like plants, but plants and GIS is, you know, not super connected. But, you know, who knows? I might go to a graduate program or I might try to get a job, which was my initial plan, but I don't really know where, where I'm going to go, but that's a little <laughs> bit about me. <laughs> wow, wow. Let me just say, Bailey, you are hitting home run after home run um, with your work that you're doing. And <clears throat> um, just listening to you made me think about uh, the tree canopy GIS uh, work that's being done by NASA right now. Um, so there is a possible connection with plants um, and trees and still connecting with your GIS. And I have some connection. I have a contact at NASA who was uh, instrumental in creating that program. So um, maybe something to look at, too. But, um, so, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's give it up. Round of applause for our guests. Um, and that was so invigorating hearing all of you all's journeys and stories and, and the work that you're doing. Um, and I really like the, the variety of just three different people that are at three different points in their career. Um, and I think that's that's a very uh, interesting, interesting thing. I would encourage you all also to right now, if you haven't already, type some questions in the chat, uh, spam the chat, <laughs> uh, fill it up, uh, any questions you may have, and we're just going to you know, run down those questions uh, kind of one by one here. Um, just want to also just thank the speakers um, for what they've been able to do here. Let me just pull it up here. And I see we have some other guests in the room here. We have uh, Richard Allen and Bart 
Merrick and Vanessa Bright. I just want to shout them out real quick. Thank you for joining. And let's check this chat out here. Okay. So. I believe our first question, unless I missed one, is from Melissa. Okay. Um, yeah, so uh, Melissa asked Nick, Nicholas, um, what have you been doing since your summers with us? And I think you kind of gave a, a little brush up on that, but you want to talk about your dipping your foot in the Chesapeake and I mean in the uh, Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean in 24 hours <laughs> activities. Yeah. Yes, I briefly mentioned that I am uh, out here working in um, doing a 12 week internship at the NOAA Santa Cruz lab, chasing around sturgeon um, in the Sacramento River, doing uh, an acoustic survey and um, a side scan and also um, ARIS, which is a sonic camera. <clears throat> but my project is out here is focusing on um, using 10 years of historical uh, acoustic data to look at habitat selection and how it might have changed within the last 10 years, um, given all the development in the Sacramento River. And the idea is to tie this back into my master's research, which also focuses focuses on using acoustic telemetry and um, sonic imagery in combination to estimate the spawning run of Atlantic sturgeon in the uh, Nanticoke River in the, um, in the Chesapeake Bay, <clears throat> in the Chesapeake Bay. So, yeah, hopefully if I can uh, time my flight right, I'll be able to get be on the in the uh, tributary of the Pacific Ocean and also the Atlantic within 24 hours, which Randy was thinking about. <laughs> yeah, um, great, great stuff, man. Uh, someone asked, uh, am I the right person to contact in regards to a partnership for collaboration for a proposal? And yes, I am. Um, I'll make sure I put my email in the chat and it's also on the form as well, slide as well. Um, someone asked, uh, what have, Nick and Bailey, what have you learned through your experience with C-Stream that you would share with future students looking to pursue a career in these fields? I think I start with that first. I, the advice that I would probably give is to um, like explore all opportunities presented to you. Um, a lot of times, I know in my experience, there were uh, opportunities that I was presented, presented with that may have been outside of either my comfort zone or something that I was interested in, but um, I encourage myself to at least explore them. And through that, you're able to identify things that you don't like, things that you do like, and you can really help tailor down your interests in science, because as we all know, it's a very broad um, you know, field of study. So I think just think exploring those all those opportunities and not turning your nose up to something that might be outside of what you're comfortable with or interested in will really help you explore your skill set as a scientist, your network, but also opportunities um, that lead from those um, experiences. I can um, talk about that too a little bit if that's okay. Um, so I definitely agree with what Nick just said, but also um, this internship is basically the first, you know, my first step at, into really doing anything. Um, so I would say um, not to be, and I know I said this kind of earlier in my, my talk, but not to be like afraid to go for it because I missed out on so many opportunities because I didn't feel confident in myself or I didn't think I was disqualified in general or just holding myself back and being afraid of, you know, I might do something wrong or, you know, um, I forgot the other thing I was going to say, but I would, I would say, you know, to go for, you know, the worst thing that can happen is, you know, you apply and you don't get it, you know, and then you just keep trying um, to get experience. I'm um, in different places. Yeah. And uh, I'll just add that, you know, you, you both are very correct. Uh, and someone else had asked a question. They said, uh, um, this one was for Bailey. They said, uh, have you 
uh, ever work. They said, where can you, where can we view your work? Example, the Harper's Ferry example, which is where I'm signing in from at this moment. <laughs> um, and then someone also said that you may want to check out uh, the, wait, I just saw it, the Nas National Park Service uh, showing your work to them because they, he, they think that William Dennison thinks they'd be very interested. Um, someone, and I, this question is for Mr. Wolf. This is just my own personal question. Someone has one similar to it. I'm going to get to that next. Um, but Mr. Wolf, what do you think are some uh, misconceptions of being a mentor for an uh, environmental program like this? Um, you know, what do you think, in a sense, uh, prevents others like yourselves? from becoming mentors in a program like this, you think? Yeah, well, I don't know that I can I can speak for other other folks. I think that there's, first of all, there might not be a familiarity in terms of uh, what the expectations are and, and what the opportunities are as well. But, you know, the, the C-Stream program is still, I'll say it's still relatively new. I guess it's been around for three years. And so word is getting out more and more. And we have had uh, the last couple of years, as you, you will be involved with, and coming up with the sort of the end of summer suite of presentations that have traditionally just been really good. And so it opens people's eyes that, you know, it's like next year they might think, well, maybe I should pursue that. So, so just not being maybe familiar with the logistics and the mechanics of, of the program is one. Uh, there probably is, there may be some concern about the time commitment. I can't, again, I can't speak for others. Having, having observed this for a couple of years with other mentors on the GIS team, I, I kind of knew what it would be coming in. Um, it also helps when you have somebody like Bailey, who is a very independent and, and very creative uh, worker. So um, I don't know that, you know, I, again, I can't speak for other people in terms of what barriers might exist. Just, gotcha. just the existence of the program <laughs> is something that, you know, not everybody has access to. We're fortunate with the Chesapeake Bay program and partnering with CRC to actually have this type of opportunity. So, yeah, Kat, Kathy Boomer says, uh, "Can you talk about some of the barriers that may limit others interested, uh, others' interests or capacity to pursue careers in our field?" And I would direct that to any of any of the panel. Talk about some barriers um, that may limit others' interests. So basically, what do you think are some things that make it tough for some more underrepresented populations to get into these industries? You think? I, I think in, uh, just in terms of some of the conversations I've had with USGS colleagues, because this is a, this is kind of the known issue. Well, it's not unique to USGS, but particularly in the geosciences, um, there is, it's very underrepresented, but part of it is, and so we have partnerships in the Southeast region with various HBCUs and other minority serving institutions, but there aren't as many programs as I, I think would be ideal in terms of the pipeline, if you will, and, and what, what folks are exposed to. And I'm, I'm thinking in terms of, uh, specifically geoscience, geographic information sciences, um, being in, in those underrepresented, the exposure in underrepresented communities and the opportunities as being one of them. Uh, but at the same time, just, you know, outreach and communication to make, this is a big deal with USGS, to make folks aware that the careers even exist because they might not, right. may not be exposed to these types of careers um, in their setting, so. Some of it's communication, some of it's, you know, just yeah. having access to information. Someone else said, uh, the next question we have here um, was, what are some recommendations that, of our presenters on st strategies for having student interns and job placements um, in, in the organization? Uh, I'm not quite sure what they meant by that, but um, 
also, I would add that if anyone on the panel would like to be a mentor, or, I'm sorry, not the panel, but on, in the audience of this call, if you're interested in being a mentor, feel free to contact me. Um, we can help set that up um, for the future. Uh, someone said any of, uh, someone said this one's for John um, from Melissa. John, can you share a bit about the rewards of being a mentor? and any advice you might have for future mentors? Uh, sure. Hey, Melissa. Um, so again, this is my first year with this. And so I touched on this a little bit in terms of benefits for the, the hosting institution, if you will. Um, from a personal perspective, having sort of that infusion of of, of youth and energy. <laughs> I hope that's okay to say. That's but being mm -hmm. as to what you know, what is the and working with Bailey and we're working with uh, and I'll I'll admit that I'm not a, a video game expert as much as I'd like to be, but being exposed to uh, younger technologies and things about how they interact with technology has, has certainly been beneficial. Um, but it's it it is rewarding to see individuals make progress on something that probably seemed insurmountable at the beginning of the summer and things starting to fall into place. And it's, it's rewarding to see a product that, that the intern could be proud of and share with others, so. I can uh, go back to Kathy's question about some of the barriers to limiting interests and in capacity uh, real quick. That's okay. Sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I just think that I can't speak enough about the power of these REUs or summer research experiences. They really do give you not only the opportunity to explore the um, environmental field and actually get a taste of it, but also to network and help facilitate the progression of that interest. Um, but with that being said, these uh, experiences are very competitive. Um, mm -hmm. So the ability for the CRC, C Stream program to work together with a lot of these RU programs and summer internships is, I think, really unique and will help kind of um, break down some of those barriers and, and continue to facilitate the uh, um, growing diversity within these unique but competitive internships. I mean, how important is that? You think? Which which part? Uh, that 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 level of engagement that you're speaking of. I mean, that divert that the the impacts of that. You think? Oh, um, I mean, I I encourage every undergraduate to do an REU, and I think it really does. I mean, prepare you, uh, helps grow your interests, and I think it's like I I can't say essential because not everybody's gonna have exposed to these opportunities, but I highly, highly recommend. And the more we can get people to participate in these and um, the other panelists have talked about virtual internships, even those are a great opportunity to kind of broaden the accessibility to these types of internships and experiences. We have a yeah, great point. Uh, we have another question and this is for any, th any three of you, um, what changes would would you recommend for the interns, the C Stream internship and the mentoring aspect of the program for CRC? Um, what changes would you recommend for the intern C Stream internship program and for the mentoring aspect of the program? You can take a second to think if you like. And just quickly follow up on that. The one item I mentioned toward the end because it came out of conversations with other mentors and the GIS team is that that linkage to the early career staffers that CRC um, administers that program. And so the interns are just really sort of one step earlier in the process of moving to a, a career, if you will. And it, it just occurred to us that there's a, some similarities and some some wisdom that even the, the staffers could share with the interns um, that right. might, because they're a couple of years maybe ahead of, of where the interns would be. So that might be another linkage for CRC to consider. Yeah, and I, and I don't know, I, I think you know uh, one of our uh, fellow colleagues, Darius Stanton. 
I, I knew him very well. Or, <laughs> he he told me. <laughs> yeah, he told me. Um, but that was something that he mentioned actually, uh, not even but a few days ago, um, how important that could be for the program. Um, because as you know, there are many staffers. <laughs> Um, yes. And many of them are doing things that may be relevant to some of these internship projects um, or even just for potential career connections. Um, so that, that was also mentioned by him. I thought I'd bring that up. Uh, Bailey or Nicholas, did you have anything to add to that? Not that okay. I can think of. All right. And the next question was, since most internships are virtual now, and me and Mr. Wolf, we've talked about this before, um, are there particular challenges with remote work locations and building strong work relationships? Um, any recommendations on what works? And I'll just, you know, kind of mention, you know, we had talked about how important or challenging it is to allow or provide an opportunity for interns to feel work office type feel uh, from a virtual setting. So I just kind of re, re remind of that talk we had had. Did you have anything to add to that about that, Mr. Wolf? Uh, so yeah, it, it is a challenge. And so it's particularly a challenge at the Bay program this year because we don't even have an office. So. <laughs> So uh, one of the things that I've encouraged and Bailey's followed up on is, is to, to reach out to other folks on the GIS team and basically have interviews with them and engage with them. Um, other opportunities, I mean, you guys provide opportunities for this interns as a group to integrate and, and uh, you know, chat, get to know each other and so forth. And then if there are other opportunities, whether they're workshops or conferences, um, you know, things that might not be typical, um, you know, not available all the time, but still might be opportunities for the intern to be engaged with the broader community, even though it is virtual. Um, there, there's to seek those opportunities out is probably more important in years like this year, as opposed to when everybody's in the same office building. Yeah. Look for those opportunities, I guess, is what I'm saying. Okay. Um, and I just want to shout out a few more people. We have Liz Feinberg in the building and Kristen. Uh, also some trailblazers in the world. If you don't know them, you may want to touch base with them. They're amazing people to know. Um, so we're going to start to kind of wrap it up a little bit. We got about you know uh, six, seven minutes left. Um, so I wanted to give a little bit of time to give each of you to just have a closing statement or closing remark. Anything that you may want to share uh, just as a closing statement for yourself? Um, anything you want to close out with or comment? I, I would just say that I, I really enjoyed this, uh, this experience. It went as well as I think it possibly could have with respect to the, the virtual setting. And CRC has been great in terms of supporting the entire process. So they, they take a lot of the legwork out of the the internship process so that the, the intern can work directly with the scientist or the analyst, whoever it might be. So I, I appreciate the opportunity. And I think that the, the arrangement that we have within the Chesapeake in particular with CRC is, is working very well. Okay. That's what Thank, I said, you. Uh, thank you for having me first. Uh, I really enjoyed this and I'm really glad that C, uh, CRC continues to host um, discussions like this so we can continue to talk about how to progress uh, diversity and inclusion within the workforce. And I really appreciate everybody for coming uh, to participate in this conversation. Um, that's, you know, that's the hardest part is getting people to engage. So I really appreciate that. And I know, in general, just all of CRC's work to uh, through the C stream and all the other outlets that you guys do to uh, make sure opportunities are presented um, clearly. And thank you, Nicholas. I just wanted to say thank you for having me as well. Um, 
And thank you everyone who, uh, with your questions and uh, your messages, I really appreciate the feedback. Um, and it's, it's really great to actually be able to show some of what I've been working on to, um, to others. I know it was only that one little thing, but um, you know, it, it feels good to be able to, to you know, show what I've been working on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I can imagine that. Especially when you're doing the kind of work you're doing still with, you know, computers and such. Um, can almost feel like you're all alone sometimes. Um, but thank you for sharing and thank you and keep up the great work. I mean, honestly, I'm really just intrigued and, and excited and really, uh, you know, just fortunate to know you because I know that throughout your career, you're going to be producing some really cool things. And uh, I just, I'm, I'm very, uh, it's very invigorating. All right, so um, I think we have one last uh, slide to show you, I believe. Um, and that is just a thank you slide. Uh, it's a wonderful discussion. Uh, thank you, Nicholas, taking the time out of your, your schedule um, and putting this, to, and, you know, being a part of this. Uh, thank you, John, as well, and Bailey. Um, if you can, join us for the next webinar, which will be on Wednesday, August 18th. And we'll be hosting that same same type venue, different topic, different panel, different uh, panelists. Um, so hope to see you all there. And if you asked a question and it was not answered, uh, do not worry. We will get answers out in emails in 24 to 48 hours for any questions that were asked that did not get answered. If anyone would like to connect with anybody on the panel, um, you can make that known uh, with, with myself or the team. And, and if you haven't seen it or have it already, I will put my link, my email in the chat here for everyone in case anyone wants to reach out or anything of that nature. All right. Okay, everybody. Well, thank you all again. Um, this is very invigorating. I mean, I got to learn a lot. I'm sure our guests got to hear some beautiful things too. Hello, Liz. All right. Um, did you have anything you wanted to share, Liz? And say hi. Okay, cool. Good job. Good to see you. Um, yeah. So thank you all, and I look forward to hearing updates on some things that you all have going on and connecting you all to any opportunities or networking that we're able to do um, for the program. All right, thank you all, see you later. Have a great Wednesday and uh, be safe out here. Stay safe, stay cool. And um, you know, enjoy your Wednesday, enjoy the rest of your week, your summer. And I'll see you all on August 18th for the next one.